Hello everyone. I'm going to today give you an update on a very exciting and interesting area in medicine as applied to heart failure, cardiovascular disease, and my area of specialization, renal medicine. Um, it's not often that we get new therapies and therapies that appear to make a big difference. I was, I've been in practice for, I don't know, around 25, maybe 30 years now. I'm old enough to remember the beginning of the ACE inhibitor and then the angiotensin receptor blocker era and what a difference they made. And while they did make a difference, no question at all about it, they actually only tended to reduce the amount of problems, perhaps delay by a year or two years the inevitable decline in kidney function. And as we realized, there's a desperate unmet medical need for additional therapies that can help. And what I'm going to be talking to you about mostly today is the STLT2 inhibitors which I think, and I, I'm prepared to admit, that when I first heard about these about 10 years ago, I wasn't convinced they would make a big difference, especially in renal patients. And therefore, I will eat a big slice of humble pie to say that I was wrong, because I think these agents are the most promising that we have before us at the moment. And indeed, as I'll touch on at the very end of the lecture, they pose some very interesting questions about whether we should be using them in a broader population not just diabetes, but other patients as well. And that's something we can look at in a little while. So greetings from London. It's uh, not like that at all at the moment. The big tower there on the right-hand side is completely covered with scaffolding, and I've never been around to see a blue sky in London, so forget that. But anyway, it looks good, doesn't it? Thank you, Photoshop. So <clears throat> where are we? In terms of diabetes, a global epidemic of mega proportions. This is because, sadly, in all parts of the world, uh, we're getting more likely to be diabetic. We're living longer, uh, although we are perfectly clear about what causes these problems in terms of food intake and exercise. The global problems of obesity only get worse. And this is a particular challenge, not so much in the so-called Western world, but actually the part of the world that will really take over in terms of scientific and financial endeavor and that's um, what used to be called rather patronizingly as the developing world. But in point of fact, uh, much of Africa, India, Southeast Asia has already become extremely developed uh, and will, in fact, uh, numerically speaking, be the, the dominant players in the world without a doubt. Uh, that will certainly create some interesting challenges. And you'll see the center of gravity shift away from the European-centric view of the world to a much more globalized perspective. Uh, in the next um, probably two decades, I would think it would be very obvious to everybody, but I don't think many people are ready. But be that as it may, we are exporting what used to be a so-called westernized set of problems around the globe. And this is causing major problems because this is uh, life shortening. It affects everybody's quality of life and increases exponentially healthcare spend. And that's a challenge for all healthcare economies new and old. So the estimated prevalence of CKD, if we look at this in its globalized perspective now, the estimated prevalence is expected to increase in all countries, some by a little perhaps, and some by an enormous amount. And we'll see what that means. If we look here, we've got Italy, Spain on the bottom there, Denmark and Iceland, all of them showing, all right, the slopes are a little bit different, the error bars are a little bit different, but well, the bottom line is, in terms of per million population, uh, you've got increases across the board here. And this is despite the best we can do. And that's because the number of people who have the risk factors for CKD. What are the risk factors? Age. If we live longer, we're going to get CKD. I'm afraid we can't stop that at the moment. In addition, as we get older, we get more hypertensive, we get more diabetes. So unless we can stop that, these uh, trends are pretty well immutable. They're going to happen. And if you put the United Kingdom in and the Netherlands, it's exactly the same depressing story. We're starting from a different place. We're increasing at different rates, but we're all starting from somewhere that's not very good. And we're ending up somewhere that's really not at all good by the end of this 10 to 15 year period. Now, the bottom line, though, is that while that might sound like an enormous increase in dialysis population, the reality is that the risk of death 
is 10 times higher than the risk of progression to end-stage renal failure. So the bottom line is that if we want to make an enormous difference to outcomes, we need to be focusing on preventing the deaths that occur. And the deaths, of course, are not due to renal disease. The deaths are due to cardiovascular disease. Ischemic heart disease, yes, still important, but we have uh, therapies that we can now use in the form of statins that make a significant difference. But in addition to that, particularly in hypertensive disease and diabetes, we have heart failure due to what you might call a form of cardiomyopathy, abnormal muscle function, metabolic changes. And as a result, the incidence of heart failure is high and climbing. Hospitalization for heart failure is high and climbing. And actually here, although there are some therapies, as we all know, in the terms of ACEs, ARBs, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, and other things, the reality is that the impact of these is not huge. And in particular, in kidney disease, sudden cardiac death is a major issue. And those drugs don't appear to make much difference to that at all. So while we're all nephrologists and very, very intent on preventing the progression of end-stage renal disease, we shouldn't, we mustn't forget that our patients will succumb in the end not to kidney failure, but the consequences and complications of kidney failure and stage renal failure, as you can see. Now, when we all learnt about diabetes and diabetic uh, implications of kidney problems, what we realised is that there are several stages, the so-called no-nephropathy stage. And what do I mean by that? In this case, what we all realise now is the earliest manifestations of diabetic damage to the kidney is in the form of microalbuminuria, or low amounts of albumin escaping into the urine. This is something, as we all know, we can screen for, and we will screen for, and we do screen for, as part of our annual uh, checks of patients with uh, long-standing diabetes. So we can have microalbuminuria, and that happens, as you can see, 2% uh, change from no nephropathy to microalbuminuria. And then micro can become macro. That's much heavier proteinuria. and then Finally, and late, perhaps 10 years late, uh, elevated serum creatinine, or 20 years, the uh, incidence of renal replacement therapy. And if you look on the far right-hand side, you can see that 1.4% no nephropathy, that's the death rate, 3% microalbuminuria, death rate, 4.6% for microalbuminuria, and a colossal 19.2% for elevated serum creatinine or renal replacement therapy. Indeed, patients who have type 2 diabetes and are on dialysis at the same time have probably an annualized mortality of 25%. And that's an extraordinarily high risk group, higher than most cancers, worse prognosis than most cancers, partly because it incorporates so many cardiovascular endpoints, in particular, the issue of heart failure. So what's the pathogenesis? If we could only understand the pathogenesis, surely today, with all the wonderful medicines we have at our disposal, surely we could prevent it all. Well, no, not completely. If we start here at the top with obesity, which is one of the main driving forces, you get the hyperglycemia, the change in the reactive oxygen species in the mitochondria, and a whole series of what you might call glucose-dependent pathways glycation end products, polyols, hexosamines, disturbance of protein kinase C. This is diabetes specific, really. With obesity, we also, as well as having the beta cell issues and the insulin issues, we have dyslipidemia, and that is one of the pro-inflammatory factors that stimulates endothelial change, both in things as small as capillaries and uh, the glomeruli, right up to uh, big blood vessels. Obesity also brings with it systemic hypertension. Now, traditionally, in the non-diabetic situation, systemic hypertension and glomerular hypertension are the things that essentially determine whether the kidney disease will be happening and how quickly it will be happening. So if you throw in obesity, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and abnormal glucose homeostasis, you have a perfect storm for the proliferation of mesangial matrix, the alteration of the filtration ability of the podocyte, the eventual thickening of the glomerular basement membrane, podocytopathy, uh, then glomerular sclerosis, loss of kidney function, and eventually the need for dialysis. At a lower level, <clears throat> in terms of the uh, hemodynamic effects, because a lot of this turns into structural effects, but if we look at the hemodynamic effects, 
we know from a very early stage that patients with obesity and hypertension and impaired glucose tolerance have impaired renal vascular regulation. So they have an excess of vasoconstrictors and a reduction in vasodilators. They have glomerular hypertension as well. Look here, systemic hypertension. But that doesn't automatically produce glomerular hypertension. But the mechanisms, the homeostatic mechanism that try to protect the glomerulus from systemic hypertension, that starts to fail because of these other metabolic disturbances. And then the glomeruli, unfortunately, take the full force of the systemic abnormality in terms of blood pressure. And as a result, uh, structural changes take place. What this slide doesn't include, and something you should be very aware of, is the issue of vascular stiffness and pulse pressure, because it's that systolic surge with each heart, heartbeat that's uh, harmful, and the diastolic uh, reduction, the widened pulse pressure, which is a particular feature of making end organs very vulnerable, whether it's the brain or the kidney, in fact, to the transmission of uh, all this excess pressure down to the, the lowest and smallest level of the circulation. Well, look, trying to make these things better, people have tried for very, very many years. There is no single silver bullet, as you might call it. We know from the Steno 2 study, this is the Guider study from, uh, from Copenhagen, published in 2003. This shows us that if we throw everything we know, everything we know, at the problem, we can reduce the risk of an adverse outcome by about 20%. Now that, I might add, is pretty good for a renal intervention. But it involves the simultaneous treatment of microalbuminuria with ACEs or ARBs or even the combination. A little more controversial these days, we know that. Hypertension, the treatment of hypertension to achieve good, sustained low blood pressure. Hyperglycemia, yes. Dyslipidemia, yes. And the secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease with antiplatelet agents and, dyslip and uh, lipid lowering therapy. Now, you can throw all of this in. You can, you can say to me, what, what's high, what, what, what is a suitable reduction in blood pressure? What is a suitable reduction in glucose? And we will deal with that in a moment. But the essence of it, these are sort of conceptual ideas. This is a suite of measures applied simultaneously. And if you do them all and have a compliant group of patients, you can get a 20% reduction. And that's good. I'm very pleased to see that. But of course, it still leaves you with an enormous amount of problems still happening over this eight-year period. Uh, approximately two-thirds of the problems have been failed to be attenuated by the addition of all these therapies. And then, let's be candid now, how many patients are going to be compliant enough to stick with all of this simultaneously for that length of time? The reality is in the real world, look how small this study is, and it's in Denmark where nobody dared disobey the doctor. They'll be exiled if they do. So in Denmark, where everything is rig rigorously and carefully controlled, you can get this much effect. In reality, in the real world, I think 5 to 10% is where we get with the exact same uh, intervention. Because of a failure of the patient uh, fully to uh, embrace this rather challenging agenda, together with the fact that the monitoring and stuff isn't as good as it would be. So, yes, we can make a difference, but there's a vast still unmet medical need there. So, if we look at that, we can see that if we follow up this, this group of patients, there's the same group of patients with conventional therapy and intensive therapy. And if we look for comp composite cardiovascular or death, death endpoints, you can see that after 21.2 years follow up from the 7.8 years of intensified therapy, you get eight additional years. Now that's phenomenal, actually, when you look at it. Not so much reaching an endpoint, but actually looking out the survival benefit of doing that. So look, there is hope there, but as I explained, it's really hard to drive all of these therapies to occur in normal populations. But it shouldn't stop us trying, but it should also tell us that there's a lot more that we should be doing and trying to do, because this isn't going to work on its own. Now we can start to think to ourselves, well, if this is diabetes, surely the better that we control diabetes and the better the blood glucose control is, then the better the outcome will be. But the reality is it has been seen in a number of studies, particularly uh, ACCORD, less so in advance, actually. There is not only a failure to reduce mortality by intensifying the blood glucose control, but there's a strong hint this is actually contributing to premature death. Because as we well know, 
if we squeeze and squeeze the blood glucose control as hard as we can, we will be running the risk of hypoglycemia, both overt and covert hypoglycemia. And that will secondarily stimulate the sympathetic nervous system and could contribute to cardiomyopathy and suffer cardiac death. So, uh, yes, we must do as well as we can with the blood glucose control, but there's a limit, there's a real limit in real life, just as I was saying with the, the intervention of the suite of five measures earlier. And similarly, this is true in CKD, because in the ACCORD cohort, which is a very large cohort, about a third of them met some criteria for CKD, and you can see here that the mortality was substantially increased, particularly death for many cause and cardiovascular. So we know now not to be too aggressive with our patients who've got impaired glucose tolerance, and 7% is about as low as it's sensible to go. I never try to get between 6 and 6.5, and for example. That's much too aggressive. Now, 7.5, I think we can do a little better than that, but we must do it cautiously. And preferentially, I suggest to you, try to use agents that have a low hypoglycemic uh, threshold or, or, or tendency, shall we call it that. So the sulfonylureas, for example, and other drugs, I'm not sure they're really the best agents in this very vulnerable group of patients. Now, a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about for the rest of the time is around SGLT2 inhibition. And really, I would say over the last uh, five, certainly five years, and a little longer, really, because these drugs take ages to develop from a great idea one afternoon into a, a worldwide therapy. That's usually about 20 years between those two uh, points on the calendar. But SGLD2 inhibition. And this really is to try to tackle the known phenomena in this context of increased urinary sodium and increased urinary glucose, which we know if we were to inhibit these by, by reducing the osmotic diuresis and hyperosmolality and volume depletion, we might do better. And the increased urinary glucose has an impact on, on uric acid, uric is urea, causes supersaturation, a number of crystal independent factors. And increased glucose itself in the tubule causes reactions uh, that are unhelpful and lead eventually to inflammation and oxidative stress, causing local tubular injury and acute tubular injury. And I think what this tells me is that without inhibiting SGLT2, these patients, these patients with diabetes, hypertension, other risk factors, are very, very prone indeed to recurrent episodes of acute kidney injury due to local tubular injury, something we simply don't recognize sufficiently. But when you do a biopsy and you're looking for a causation and you find frequently that there are pockets of tubular injury there, that, that's not all that unusual. And it's also how well these pockets of tubular injury lead to regeneration or whether they lead to repetitive, repetitive damage, leads to a cycle that leads to chronic renal disease. One of the most important new concepts of the last 10 years, that AKI promotes CKD, particularly recurrent AKI, something we must look very carefully about in terms of prevention. But there are now a whole stack of new drugs that are targeted around the SGLD2, and these are designed to inhibit uh, the pathway and basically to allow for more glucose loss through the kidney, as we'll see. So how, how they're working is essentially looking at uh, where glucose is reabsorbed. We can see that more than 90% of glucose is reabsorbed uh, in the tubules, the other proximal convoluted tubule. And there's a little bit of spillover, 10% reabsorbed a little later. But this is the area where if we were able to inhibit that happening, there would be a glucose loss through the kidney. There would be glycosuria. Now, glycosuria, you know, when we were taught as medical students, certainly when I was, approximately the time of Galen, um, you were clear that glycosuria was a bad sign. It was a sign of or incipient diabetes, or it may be a sign of uh, an altered renal threshold, to be sure. But in this particular situation, this is glycosuria that's therapeutic because it's caused by a reduction in the excretion ability of the kidney, allowing more to escape, carrying with it that glucose, helping to improve blood sugar control, and also preventing a number of other uh, disturbed factors that take place uh, otherwise without the inhibition of the pathway. So with this clever SGLD2 inhibition in the renal tubules, you get glycosuria, 
you get a lot of things actually. You get glycosuria, a negative calorific balance, definitely a reduction in total body fat mass, which may, now there's a few mays creeping in here, reduce epicardial fat and may improve cardiac contactility and reduce cardiac fibrosis. That's a big plus if we can get that to happen. Similarly, we improve glucose control. We'll come back to that at the end, as I promised you, because the extent to which this is a key pathway is, is obviously the case for diabetes patients. But what about non-diabetes patients? But if you can improve the glucose pathway without causing hypoglycemia, key point, you can improve uh, inflammation and glucose toxicity, direct and indirect. You can also improve the uric azuria that you see, reducing the plasma uric acid and reducing the atherosclerotic burden that, that produces. So that's the glycosuria arm and the naturesis arm, which is terrifically important and something we're very familiar with and have been doing, goodness me, for decades with diuretics. We improve blood pressure, we improve arterial stiffness, we improve the tubular glomerular feedback situation and reduce glomerular hypertension. We reduce plasma volume and reduce the tendency for plasma for ventricular arrhythmias from cardiac protection. Essentially, we do all the things we want to do. Uh, and we don't activate the sympathetic nervous system like so many other interventions like short-term blood pressure control or short-term glucose reduction can do because that would then adversely uh, impinge on the cardiac and, and particularly the renal out, uh, outcome. So these are virtuous things that we should want to try to achieve if only we have the opportunity to do it. Now we all know the story that when these drugs were first being developed, the FDA and the EMA said, yes, they do look interesting, don't they, manufacturers? But you're going to have to show us that these drugs don't have a cardiovascular detriment because it, is, it was well known that while you could improve things on the one hand, you might be causing more things that are bad on the other if you give with one hand and take with the other. So the idea was to see whether or not in regulatory trials there was any evidence that these drugs were harmful. Now, of course, everybody went into this, the manufacturers were hoping that the drugs would be neutral, uh, and in fact an extraordinary outcome was seen, is that even though these were trials that were essentially conceived and planned and executed as equivalency studies, there are always statistical breakpoints and rules that allow you to determine that there is superiority, and without a doubt, uh, empagliflozin in this first of the studies showed that there was a benefit for being on it, with reductions in heart failure, death from any cause. Uh, and death cardiovascular causes. And this really was an extraordinary day when these results were, were released. Many refused to believe it, stuck their head in the sand, and said, I don't want it to be happening. Uh, it must be a one-off. It couldn't never happen again. And as we know, and I'll show you at the end of my talk, this is now what everybody believes happens and what everybody's trying to do. But that's how it all started, with regulatory concerns. The same favorable effect was shown with canagliflozin and the CANVAS program, here published uh, just two, two and a half years ago now. You can see that there are, look, these curves are not massively different. I'll, get you, I'll grant you that. But the trials are very, very big, and the direction of travel in terms of the outcomes are the same. The, the reduction there is 13%, the reduction there is 15%, the reduction here is 10%. Not massive, I grant you, but always in the same direction. Of benefit. And this is not what we would have originally have expected from the drugs that are working in this way by reducing glucose reabsorption and in increasing glucose loss through the kidneys. And then I think we also began to realize that we shouldn't just view this as an improvement or a better outcome, but we ought to ask the question, but from what? What is it exactly that is better for, for this? So looking at large population-based studies now, if you're looking at SGLD2 inhibition versus conventional glucose lowering therapy, looking at patient death, these are registries, these are market surveys that are prone to bias. So I'll be very clear with you, these are prone to bias. They're not perfect. They're out there in the real world sort of studies. But again, if you have these Scandinavian registries, these are always uh, here, these three, these are always pretty pretty high quality, let's be honest about it. Everything about everybody is known in these countries. And you can see that it's very clear that there's a marked improvement for being on an SGLT2 inhibitor. Uh, this is for treatment unadjusted and treatment adjusted. We'll come back to treatment later, because of course, 
it could be argued that this is really only a proxy for not being on other therapies that would work just as well. But as I'll show you a little later, that's absolutely not the case. So treated or untreated, there's evidence of, of therapy and improvement. And again, one of the most interesting things is that these patients with uh, diabetes and kidney disease are very prone to heart failure, and heart failure hospitalization is significantly reduced. Now, why, you may be asking? How, you may wonder? And is that simply the fact that there's a sort of osmotic diuresis and a, a slight quasi-diuretic effect? I don't think we can explain it that clearly, because you don't see it particularly tracking with the change in blood weight, uh, with sorry, with body weight, or the change in hematocrit, for example, indicated within the concentration. So it's it's not entirely through that mechanism. It's probably more hemodynamic to do with blood pressure and other factors affecting the heart. So what what are the hemodynamic effects? Well, with with or without diuretic therapy, the presence of in this case empagliflozin was associated with a significant reduction in blood pressure. And you can see here, it's around three to five millimeters of mercury. Not very much, I hear you say, but really, let's have a think about that for a moment, because it is quite a lot, particularly when your baseline mean systolic blood pressure is only 130. So it's quite a significant further reduction. 12 weeks, I agree, but it's quite obvious that there was a change in blood pressure. And we know from other studies that this change is actually sustained. And one of the key things that I'll show you at the end as well is that it doesn't really matter whether you're on an ACE or an ARB. Okay, interestingly, this is very interesting, and it may be borne out from other studies. If you're already on an ACE or an ARB, and therefore have all the benefits that might accrue from those therapies, you have a bigger response to the presence of an SPLT2 inhibitor than you do if you're not on the other therapy. So far from it being something that's simply equivalency to existing therapy, it looks as though there's synergy between the best previous therapy, here we are, and the best new therapy, SGLD2 inhibition. If so, really exciting, actually, to find that there is that situation. Uh, and those agents improve blood pressure, but they also improve the pulse pressure. Remember when I was talking to you a little earlier about the importance of pulse pressure and the barrow trauma, destroying small, fragile, vulnerable capillaries. Uh, and this is reduced by the presence of the SGLD2 inhibitor. So another potential very serious benefit, converting the hemodynamic changes into benefit in the kidney, uh, and probably elsewhere as well. So if you compare canagliflozin uh, with uh, glimepramide, for example, you'll see that the annual rate of decline of GFR was much lower in both uh, doses of canagliflozin, 100 and 300 milligrams, compared to the glimepramide. So even though the sugar control was the same, if you wait a couple of years, you can see a, a marked improvement in the GFR. So here's the, the uh, drop of six mils in about two years, that's three mils per minute per year. And here is a drop probably of around 0.6 mils per minute per year. So two thirds of the drop has been attenuated. A small uh, initial drop in, G, in GFR when you go onto the drugs, but thereafter, uh, stability. And this is really an identical situation to patients who are put on ACE inhibitors, a small initial hemodynamic change and reduction in GFR, but then that rapidly compensates, and the patients then have stable renal function compared to those who go on to, in this case, it's glimepiramide, but this could just as easily uh, be a non-ACE, non-ARB blood pressure reduction agent, so that you get a reduction over time. So again, clear-cut evidence of renal protection. Uh, any problems in terms of cardiovascular mortality? None. None of any significance. Anyway. So uh, no significant difference in the risk of cerebrovascular events versus placebo. Does it reduce uh, cardiovascular mortality? Well, it does, and it does change hematocrit, hemoglobin, albumin, and uric acid in the right direction. But is that the explanation? I don't think so. Only about a third of the effect of the impact on mortality from predictions from epidemiology could be explained by the measurable changes of uric acid, fasting plasma glucose, and glycated hemoglobin. So I think it's more than this, but clearly this is acting in the right direction in all cases. So empagliflozin associated with slower progression of kidney disease and lower rates of clinically relevant renal events. So renal composite outcomes, the incidence of worsening nephropathy, that's change in plasma creatinine, also here on the composite outcomes, the development of uh, 
not just a reduced GFR to less than 59, but also the development of heavy proteinuria and clear-cut evidence of renal protection. So when we look at the situation here in this group of patients, worsening nephropathy or cardiovascular death improved, incident of worsening nephropathy on its own improved, progression to macroalbuminuria improved, doubling of serum creatinine or reduction to less than 45 mL per minute corrective of body surface area improved, initiation of renal replacement therapy just on the cusp of improvement. By the way, the reason why the error bars are so wide is that the event numbers are very small there. Doubling of serum creatinine accompanied by GFR improved and incident albuminuria. Well, yeah, that's not true because that, of course, is a harder nut to crack and would require a longer exposure to the drug in the first place. Now, we have to ask some questions at this point, but should be asking some questions at this point. What would happen if we use these drugs, but in CKD patients without diabetes? Now, wait a minute, I hear you say. These are drugs that improve glucose total body handling by reducing total body glucose, by preventing reabsorption. So what would happen in somebody whose glucose isn't already raised? The answer appears to be the risk of hyperglycemia is extremely small, but you still can get a reduction in total body glucose doing it this way. And that would open up the possibility, and I emphasize the word possibility, that the use of these drugs, inhibitors of SGLT2, could have the similar benefit, or some benefit anyway, in CKD patients without diabetes. And that would then beg the question, but at what case, stage of CKD? How proteinuric would they have to be? Would they be only those at a high overall risk, like prior cardiovascular disease? Or could we, as the pharmaceutical companies would love us to conclude, should we be using this, could we be using this in almost everybody at any stage of kidney disease? Way too early, in my opinion, to make these sweeping statements. We need good, solid data, good, solid evidence, and we don't have that. But the important thing is that people are beginning to ask these questions and start to do big trials to answer those questions. So within the next few years, we will know the answers to all the questions in green on that slide. But we do know that empagliflozin improves the outcomes for clinical outcomes for mortality with patients with type 2 and CKD. We know that. Here are clear-cut data to show that that's the case. With or without kidney disease, with or without heart failure, prevalent kidney disease or not, mortality, hospitalization, we know that. And we know that... Um, Systolic blood pressure reduction and weight reduction with empagliflozin are present in patients with CKD. Do you remember that so many people believe so-called nihilism, that in the presence of renal disease, nothing works with CKD? You can't use this, you can't use that, and nothing seems to improve it. But the evidence really is against that in this situation, because there is evidence that the drugs do work in terms of reducing systolic blood pressure and body weight across the GFR threshold greater than 90, 60 to 90, 30 to 60, so this is CKD stage 3. And quite likely, though there aren't really enough patients yet to be sure about this, it might even work in CKD stage 4. We certainly ought to look. Of course, people are going to say, well, hang on a minute. There aren't enough tubules there to have the impact in the first place. And the evidence certainly is that by the time you get to CKD, CKD stage 4, um, the impact of these drugs on glucose homeostasis is much reduced. But you know what? I wouldn't like to rule it out. I would not like to rule out the possibility it may have utility or benefit there. But I think these patients should be studied, in my opinion. So there is preservation uh, of uh, the change in weight and blood pressure, though the impact on the glucose control is much more marked, it must be said, at this stage. And dapagliflozin also consistently decreases body weight, blood pressure, and urinary albumin to creation, creatinine ratio, regardless of the GFR. So again, these are the cohorts, 45 to 60, 60 to 90, greater than 90. And again, the impact is there. Blood pressure reduction, weight reduction, glycated hemoglobin reduction, a little bit less in the case of the patients with the worst GFR. But look, broadly speaking, the hemodynamic and other effects are present. And it's not impacted upon by the presence of a GFR change. And here, decrease urinary albumin creatinine ratio, blood pressure, and body weight. Same story, really, with dapagliflozin. So it's all beneficial, and you shouldn't stop it because of a loss of kidney function, even you may, though you may think it's too late. 
Of course, for the presence of balance in this talk, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that there are other agents that have potential impacts as well. Uh, DPP4 uh, inhibitors are also interesting. They reduce glycated hemoglobin. They may well have significant impacts on the vasculature and inflammation. Could these be synergistic with the SGLT2 inhibitors? Don't know yet. Interesting concept, whether these things can happen side by side. Expensive therapies, as are SGLT2 inhibitors. So it's not going to be so easy to use them in the same cohort at the same time over a long period of time. Those of you who believe that magnesium is important in cardiovascular pathogenesis will take uh, interest in the fact that with normalization of serum magnesium, and by the way, in, in diabetic nephropathy, there's a much higher incidence of hypermagnesemia than in generalized nephropathy. And this was uh, significantly ameliorated and improved by the presence of chemoglycosin. Will that produce a better outcome? I don't know, but it's not something I would re regard as a harmful consequence of the use of the therapy for sure. And similarly, hyperuricemia with attendant gout and all the uh, indignities and suffering that this causes uh, was reduced by the presence of SGLD2 inhibition. And that may also pay dividends if you believe that uric acid is a cardiovascular promoter. Now, recent studies, this is recently produced, Gert Mayer from uh, Innsbruck in Austria, an international cohort of people. And this was asking an important question from uh, the, out the original Empereg outcome study that I started with, you remember, from 2015, asking the question whether or not patients who have CKD, type 2 diabetes, does the presence or absence of ACE inhibitors or diuretics or calcium channel blockers or non steroidal anti-inflammatory agents, does that have any impact on the benefit you see from using SGLT2 inhibitors? And the answer is no. The simple answer is that whether you do or whether you don't use them, particularly in the case of diuretics, remember, people have said all this is with SGLT2 inhibition is just a mild form of diuretic. Not so, because whether you're on a diuretic before or not on a diuretic before doesn't have an impact on whether this works. It works in either situation. It works if you're on a calcium channel blocker. Uh, it it uh, doesn't seem to work as well if you're on non-steroidal. But you know what? Nothing works if you're on non-steroidal. You should be asking the question, what on earth are you doing on a non-steroidal? Because they're not very helpful. But um, broadly speaking, this is a benefit wherever we see it. So it seems that M in the Empereg study, any GFR and any proteinuria, you can find a benefit for being on these drugs. And that, I think, is a very positive message going forward. Unresolved, though, uh, around the heart failure endpoint, which is such an important one, it's one thing to show improvement in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. What about HEFPEF, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, where to date there are very, very few benefit treatments that have uh, been demonstrated. And my goodness, what a huge effort has been put into finding them. But it doesn't, it isn't the same type of, of um, uh, underlying problem as, we, as the situation with reduced ejection fraction. And similarly, what about preventing new onset heart failure? But what about those uh, patients who've already got existing heart failure? Will that help them if they've already gone over the edge and onto the slippery slope towards end stage heart disease? So to draw it all together, essentially what we want to do is to improve a number of different things. We want to improve insulin control, we want to reduce SGLD2 in the kidney. We want to reduce the sympathetic outflow to the kidney from the central nervous system and the heart and to the blood vessels. And this will have a beneficial impact on a whole stack of things that eventually cause, uh, by cumulative action and conspiracy, to cause uh, some very bad adverse outcomes indeed. And from wh whether we're talking at uh, micro intracellular level, at the level of the, uh, the mitochondria here, as you can see in terms of the ATP metabolism homeostasis, we can improve myocardial energetics. This likely lies at the heart of a lot of problems to do with chronic fatigue and frailty. Uh, we can improve these outcomes. We can improve glomerular hemodynamics and reduce the damage to the kidney. We can reduce heart problems. And we can have a diuresis and naturesis, improving blood pressure, glycosuria, and a reduction in proteinuria. That's really a, a big win. It recently published in C, C. Jason. Uh, you, I really think you should read this. So go to see Jason. It's, it's a, a free to air, as it were, uh, paper. So you don't have to be a member of the American Society of Nephrology to get access to this. But this is from Catherine Tuttle and David Sherney on behalf of the Diabetic Kidney Disease Task Force of the American Society of Nephrology. This is really bringing together some thoughts around 
where are we now in 2020? This is hot off the press. Where are we now in terms of Empereg and Canvas and Declare and Virtus and Creedon and Dapper CKD, which is undergoing at the moment, and Emper Kidney? These are the two that are going to examine the concept of whether or not we should be using these agents in CKD patients without diabetes. So very important. Where are we now in terms of this, in terms of how we review this as nephrologists? Should we simply be waiting for diabetologists to get on and do these things, or should we ourselves take a leading role in treating these patients effectively? And if we look at the specific ones around uh, uh, the kidney, Cambus, Declare, Empereg, and Credence, we can see that Credence is so very important because it took uh, a GFR range much lower than the other three. It took patients with a much, uh, with, with a moderate size of cardiovascular risk, but not as high as Empereg, for example. And this is very typical of uh, CKD patients. But it also took patients with very substantially increased amounts of macarons. And yet the impact, as I showed you earlier, it doesn't really matter whether you've got GFR reduction or protein reduction, the protein increase, you get the benefit from being on these drugs at any stage of kidney disease. And if you took all those things, four, four trials together, this is really what they're saying. And I'll read it for you quickly, because this is the last slide. It's time to spread the word that these new therapies for diabetic kidney disease have arrived with accumulated evidence in over 40,000 patients who have participated in Empereg, Canvas, Declare, Timmy, 58, and Credence, this is an opportune moment to move forward with FTLD2 inhibitors. As in the clinical trials, it's also critical to deliver the standard of care, an ACE or an R. These are not either or. It's essential that they're all there at the same time. Going back to what I was showing you earlier with the STEDO study, combinations work so well. Synergy is what we're after. Given the remarkable reduction in risks of heart failure and end-stage renal disease, STLD2 inhibition is expected to be quite cost-effective. Not proven yet, by the way, but because you're reducing horribly costly detrimental outcomes, it's likely that it can be quite cost-effective. Another important topic for ongoing research. Therefore, the ask of payers and drug makers is to make these patients available and affordable. How, if they're more affordable, We'll use them more. How many times has that fallen on deaf ears from uh, the pharmaceutical giants? Nevertheless, it's got to be said. Facilitators to delivering the right treatment to the right patient at the right time must be prioritized. Healthcare systems must prioritize it. Guidelines must prioritize it. The present challenge is to assure that the breakthrough benefits of STLT2 inhibitors are safely provided to a steadily growing population of patients with diabetic kidney disease who may benefit. Who may benefit? The majority, probably. Final point. Remember, more patients likely die from underuse, historical underuse, of ACEs and ARBs in diabetes because of unjustified fears of an increase in serum creatinine and potassium. This is likely to be exactly the same pattern with SGLD2 inhibitors. Excessive fears. What are the fears? of um, problems with uh, urinary tract infections, which are definitely more common in this group of patients. But other issues, such as uh, fractures, uh, such as acute kidney injury, other complications that have been associated with the use of these drugs do not appear to be borne out by large-scale, cumulative, meta-analyzed, per patient, patient-level outcome studies. So I think these are safe drugs, there's very little potential for harm that these drugs can cause. We should become better at picking at patients who respond best to them and setting the scene so that patients can then enjoy all of the correct therapies at the same time and derive benefit and stay off the ghastly decline in kidney function uh, slide that ends up in the need for dialysis, transplantation and premature death. So I think this is the most exciting time to be involved in this area that I've ever known. And I commend all of these studies to you. And I hope that we'll find that in time we get even better evidence. That this is a game changer in the management of chronic kidney disease in diabetes and maybe even in just chronic disease, kidney disease overall. What a time it is. Thank you for your attention.